funny. I mean, we've seen how the news cycle works a little bit because when it comes to Manchester United and the Glazers, yeah, everyone's been hugely critical of them, both this season, perhaps since they walked into the club back in 2005. But the headlines up until Elon Musk's tweet, I think, was it middle of the night on Wednesday, had been about their poor recruitment, the terrible form on the pitch, not about new investment coming in. And then what did he say, Elon Musk, Martin? What what was that tweet? He said, by the way, I'm buying Manchester United. You're welcome. And then he, uh, when somebody said, are you serious? A bit later on, he said, no, it's just a long running joke on Twitter. I'm not buying. Well, there was a bit of a tracks. gap. There was a bit of a gap so, between the two tweets. Yeah, there's a lot like, of uh, gap, I don't know, about yeah. a thousand articles to be written in the space of three hours before he said he was joking, <laughs> which, which uh, you know, again, it was it was shows you how fast news travels around the world. And and well, someone like Musk, who sometimes he's serious when he tweets, isn't he? Because he announced his his bid to buy Twitter itself, I think on. On, on the platform. So how do you cover someone like that? Yeah, well, it's difficult. I suppose you have to take it at face value. But if he says something like that, you take it at face value until he uh, until he says something different. I mean, it's not the, it wouldn't have been the first person to announce a sort of intentions via Twitter. It wasn't that the uh, the guy from Spotify was who, who was talking about buying Arsenal. I think he, he, he did a lot of his communications via Twitter. You know, that, that's Elon Musk. But what about Manchester United? We've had two days since of pretty frenzied speculation about the future of the club and, and the Glazers. Yeah, so what it does, obviously, sort of everybody then thinks, well, actually, what is happening with Manchester United? And then yeah, stories come up. I mean, the Glazers are always looking at ways of sort of monetizing their ownership, aren't they? So they've twice last uh, year they sold chunks of shares, Um so they're always like looking at that, um, and you know they look. They the other thing is then people who are interested. For example, Sir Jim Ratcliffe, Britain's richest man, Ineos major shareholder, um, told my colleague Matt Dickinson that um, he wants to buy the club. You know, uh, he's a Manchester United fan. Um, if if it's for sale, well, it's he'd funny, be interested. You didn't bother ringing. <laughs> The Glazers or their bankers up, but told your pal Matt Dickinson. So I feel like the approach for Manchester United, this might be a pattern that you, because they're so unpopular with fans, you do go very public and kind of ratchet up that pressure. At least that's what it looks like with with Ratcliffe there. And, you know, he's a, he's a very rich man, one of the world's richest men. So it probably wouldn't be too difficult for him to get hold of you know, one of the Glazer siblings or, or their finances. It's a surprise he's not done it. But in terms of the Glazer mind, they have done really well out of this because, you know, if you look back at when they bought Manchester United, it was a leverage buyout, which meant they just loaded all that debt onto the club. It was about £800 million, I think, back in um, 2005. And they literally feel well, not literally, but they almost put none of their own money into into this club. Um, and Manchester United essentially has paid for the privilege of being owned by the Glazers. Um, now that privilege has cost Manchester United a billion pounds, more than a billion pounds, and the value of Manchester United is way more than that eight hundred pounds, uh, eight hundred million pounds. So it, it's a remarkable feat of financial engineering. Pretty nasty. Um, Richard Masters, Martin, Rob. I think he he said recently that they're looking to get rid of these these type of buyouts, hasn't he? Yeah, the, I mean, the, the clubs are going to be voting, on, I think, in probably next month, if if that, if it uh, gets that far. But it, it's not just not just the uh, United style leverage buyouts like Burnley, which we've talked about before. Um, just putting so much debt onto the club. It, I mean, a lot of the debt has been paid down, but it's still something like three hundred and twenty million pounds. But actually, you know, what we have seen in the last 10 days, and especially since all this takeover talk, is that the share price of Manchester United has like gone up two dollars, more than $2. So from, uh, it's now, I think, close of, you know, it was $13.90, $13.90, which is only just below what it floated at in 2012. But it was about $2.20 lower than that about 10 days ago. So 
just the last 10 days, the Glazers investment has, I know it's all sort of paper money, but it has gone up something like 250 million pounds. So this take a talk is good for them. As we say that, you know, they're always looking at ideas of, you know, do they need to sell a stake in the club? Um, that make financial good sense for them and probably doesn't make much good sense in selling it when the share price is low, does it? But if they can get it back up again, then it, then it, then it might do. But what? Yeah, well, hang on, hang on, though. hang on, wait, wait, wait. But the share price for me has got absolutely nothing to do with how much anyone's going to pay for Man United because it's up to them what they what they sell the the club for. Um, my, you know, you you look at you look at Man United, and you look at Chelsea that sold in 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 this in the summer or spring. Um, Chelsea somehow losing what about a million quid a week under Abramovich. No sign of any kind of profits in the near future, and is not Man United in terms of popularity or anything like that. Sold for three billion dollars or the equivalent of three billion dollars, two and a half billion pounds. Now, if that's Chelsea, and we've just said Manchester United's price on the stock exchange is two point two billion, I just it just almost football clubs like Manchester United, I think, are so rare that valuing them on, you know, the, the, the balance sheet feels a little bit unlikely. And the Glazers will just keep hold of it if anyone offers them anything, even $2 more than than, than what what the um, share price is right now. I mean, that's just my opinion. Maybe, maybe maybe they are in a desperate need to get rid of this thing. But, you know, the, just the, the scarcity makes it so unlikely that it will be um, less than Chelsea. Yeah, I mean, the it's something like two hundred million pounds will be needed. They want to get Old Trafford up to ninety thousand. I mean, Kieran Maguire, the football finance author, he he says it in terms of getting a loan for that sort of money, that that's okay because you know you, you, that's that's covered by the um, that's covered by the, you know the extra income you're going to receive. A bit like Spurs have got a big debt for for their new stadium, and it sort of makes financial sense. But they, I mean it. Interesting. So that one of the things United have been talked about um, this week are, is uh, sort of having exploratory talks with a company called Apollo Global. Um, now, sort of variously suggested that this, you know, this could be selling a minority stake to the company. But speaking to somebody in the industry who's quite close to the company, they, they say that's not the sort of thing they do. They're a, they're a finance provider. They're not. They don't buy shares as such. It's just wondering if they're inter- if they're exploring options a bit like Barcelona did. You know when they sold twenty five percent of their future TV rights um, income over um, for the next twenty five years. They've sold that and in, and they've got getting hundreds of millions of euros up front. It's just a, it's an alternative way of raising money, um, and I guess it's quite good because it doesn't go down as debt on your company accounts. Um, so I wonder if they're looking at that, and that's what I mean. Apollo, they've done this sort of thing. They did an offer for the Mexican League, one point three billion dollars for um, a share of their international rights over fifty years, I think. So. It's the sort of thing they're looking that Apollo have done before. Interesting if that's what the Glazers are actually looking at. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see whether any anything happens. Um, you know, with with the Glazers, the the one thing that's been extremely consistent under their ownership is how tight lipped they've been. You know, you've had various frenzies around the Glazer ownership um, throughout. You know, nearly what um, two decades almost anyway. 17 years and they just very rarely if ever declare what their intentions are so yeah it could be what what something uh like what you're describing martin it could be um a, a minority share and or, or it could be it could be nothing and but in terms of a full takeover i was i was checking with with people who um you know would be associated with a sale they were associated with 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 selling the club to to manchester to to the Glazers, and the suggestion is like the club isn't in any meaningful sense up for sale. That doesn't mean if a massive number comes in, it's not going to be sold. Like everything else, it's it's not for sale until someone gives you a big big check. I remember um, Chelsea. 
under Abramovich, Joe Rabbit, that banker at Rain that who ended up selling it. Chelsea were not for sale, but there was always a sense there was a price as well from around 2018 when when Abramovich had his visa issues, and and you know you know that offers were being made sporadically and collected by by Rain and presumably for for United and for any other football club there are inquiries and offers and there are bankers who are sort of acting as intermediaries for those so you know so what we're saying is something could happen or nothing could happen so not very useful (laughs) (laughs) what do you think is more controversial getting a a 200 million loan so adding to the debt or selling future tv rights in in terms of money up front which which is more for the fans which is more controversial I don't know. I mean, Manchester United is, we've got to say, is very different to Barcelona because Barcelona is a member's own club, um, slightly different to a fan owned club, but they have 140,000 members who, um, who, who have a, I suppose, a stake in the club. There isn't an owner here. It's a private investor or private investors who own the club and they run the business their way. Either way, it will be money going out of the club to pay, to pay something off. Now, it depends what that money is used for. If it's used to increase value, improve the stadium facilities, that's not a bad use of debt either way you do it. But if it is and has been, in the sense of the Glazers, debt just for the sake of being owned by the Glazers, that will always be a bad thing, whatever you say. Yeah, I mean, interestingly, just sort of learned this week that um, at one point, Tom Bowley was looking at buying Tottenham Hotspur and um, tried to get the Saudi Public Investment Fund via Amanda Staveley in, involved in buying that club. And I, I think, that, from what I understand, talks did go quite a, quite a way um, with, 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 with Tottenham before it sort of, I don't know, if it, I don't know why it failed in the end with the thought it was too, they're asking too much. Certainly were asking considerably more than um, they've paid for Newcastle United, that's for sure. Ziggs, yeah, it's interesting it was Tottenham because um, Abramovich, of course, was looking at at Tottenham before moving to Chelsea as well, so some parallels there. But it's the PIF, the public investment fund element, that perhaps is the most interesting. Um, They obviously are the Saudi state investment fund and bought Newcastle with um, the Rubin brothers and Amanda Staveley. Um, So it was odd. what happened in the days that followed uh, in recent times, because there have been these reports that the public investment fund is very invested in, in Clear Lake, Chelsea's majority owner. Um, and some of these reports is questioning whether there's a degree of separation that's suitable for, for the Premier League. I, the idea that PIF might own two clubs or at least part of two clubs. Um, there's a couple of reports, I uh, saw one in the Daily Mail and, and, and elsewhere. So then I found it a little bit strange that on Sunday, Chelsea's first home game in the Clear Lake box is um, Amanda Staveley. Her team isn't playing very prominently there with her husband, her dad, at the Chelsea Tottenham game. And given these headlines, you'd thought, you know, let's just keep a bit of a low profile, hope it all goes away. And Rob, there was um, there was another piece of news connecting the public investment fund with a, another Chelsea investor, wasn't there? Well, it's always worth keeping an eye on. I mean, I, I, th- I think the fact that Stavely was was in in the box of Bowley is a sort of in- illustration of the fact that they've known each other from before, isn't it? Um, as we've just talked about, and uh, and I think Jonathan Golsey was also part of that uh, those that initial sort of talk about bidding for, for Tottenham Hotspur. So, yeah, I think there's, um, it's a sort of uh, a cosy little circle. Martin, people uh, who've been at recent Premier League meetings have, have talked about how close um, um, Amanda Staveley and, and Todd Bowley are, I suppose. They seem to get on very well. And that perhaps speaks to that previous business relationship. And, and Bowley in particular has, has been seen as quite a popular figure uh, among some of the other Premier League owners as well, not not least because he took them all all to a slap up dinner um, in in London 
after the last meeting. I remember talking to to um, an executive of another Premier League club. I was very excited. I can't remember what restaurant he, he took them to, but it was supposed to be very nice and they were really looking forward to going. Um, so, um, you know, that that arriving arriving in style, I suppose. Yeah, it's funny, like, you know, all these executives, you know, earning hundreds of thousands of pounds, yet they still get really excited. They're getting a free dinner. Well, from Saudi Public Investment Fund to more Saudi sport, there's boxing this weekend um, and focus again on just why the Saudis are spending so much money on sport. Yeah, uh, it's called uh, Rage by the Red Sea. It's been, oh, well, that's what it's being billed as. I suppose not Not maybe the 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 most um, smart title for something, given where the location is and, and there's a lot of rage, depending on which uh, minority group you happen to be from in Saudi Arabia. Um, but yeah, it's this is the fight between um, Anthony Joshua and Alexander Usyk, the Ukrainian heavyweight who, who beat him the last time, so a rematch. But what struck me were these quotes from Eddie Hearn, um, Anthony Joshua's manager. He he really is unapologetic about being there. And he said, look, um, he compared it to the last time. And he said, look, I've had zero stick this time around. Last time I had someone asking me, are you happy with yourself for staging this fight? Um, and he said, you know, told them, well, they're here, they're airing it, so they're all hypocrites. Um, now he's saying nobody's nobody's asking him. And that's the first thing I found interesting. And that's the point. It kind of gets normalised. If something keeps happening over and over again, the criticism gets dulled. We've seen it with, with Newcastle, perhaps with the Premier League. It, it, the, the, the kind of um, focus on Saudi Arabia has obviously diluted over time, like like with anything. And then the second thing he said also struck me, and he compared the boxers and how they're approaching it, what they're saying, to the people from the Saudi golf event, this Live Golf event, where they're saying anything but talking about the enormous buckets of money uh, they're getting. And Eddie Hearn said not talking about the money is a, is a big mistake. They should never shirk from talking about the money. He said they should be saying, I'm being paid an absolute fortune and I quite fancy playing where I choose. What do you make of that? I think you're right. It's, it is normalised now because you know, the longer it goes on, the, the more sports events are staged there, then it all becomes sort of, yeah, it's a normal and you, know, you can keep on asking people about the human rights and... and eventually people stop asking about that or you know I, I think we will probably continue to ask about that but uh, other people will stop asking about it um it's a yeah i mean i read a big piece for sunday times around the, 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 the saudis and sport and james dorsey as an academic is a really interesting figure he's saying that, you know this is this is all about you know, power and influence you know the saudis are They've already brought in a, 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 a new law which is going to take effect in three years' time. That if you want to do business with the Saudi government, then you have to have your regional headquarters based in Saudi Arabia. You can't, you can't be in Dubai, for example. So they want to be a, a hub of everything, business and sport, because they've seen what's happened, like what Qatar done, what Abu Dhabi have done. And they, they want that. And they want to be the they want to be the, the, the big boys for sport in, in the Gulf. Yeah, if you, if you talk to um you know, human rights um, a- activists who know the region, that they would say, it, despite these kind of efforts at modernization, you know, you've seen, you've seen the, the, the power of the um, religious police almost disappear overnight. You, you've seen, you know, mixed gendered um, restaurants, cafeterias, concerts, etc. But the, the oppression has, has only doubled down under Mohammed bin Salman. So you, you're kind of str- straddling two things. You know, if you look to the left, it's all nice and shiny and new and, and progressive. Just make sure you don't look to the right. And I think a lot of Western um, counterparts of this, be they athletes or, or lawyers, accountants, TV companies, whoever is taking this money, are, are, are preferring to only look at the left and, and, and then um, speak and repeat the public relations lines that that have been fed by by the by the Saudi state and the expensively hired public relations professionals. It it's not going away, is it? This 
No, it shouldn't. Yeah, interesting one. Um, Mike Dean, who's a sort of full-time VAR in the Premier League, um, he's just started doing a, this season, doing a paid-for newspaper column, the Daily Mail. And um, it, quite controversially, he's admitted that he made a mistake uh, in a sort of fairly crucial point of the, of the Tottenham Hotspur against Chelsea match um, at Stamford Bridge, where he, um, one, one of the uh, Chelsea players, had his hair pulled um, before a corner, and then it, he didn't he didn't intervene. The referee didn't see it, and then uh, from, as a result of that. Another corner happened and Tottenham scored an equaliser. So initially, the, the sort of PGMOL, the, the body which covers the elite referees, they they didn't accept that there'd been a mistake. They didn't necessarily deny one. They didn't accept. I just said it was a sort of subjective decision. Suddenly, he writes his column, um, for which he's paid a fee, and where he says, yeah, I made a mistake. Yeah, so this was it's really weird. Um, the, the the way the way this has gone down. This was the incident between um, uh, Christian Romero and Mark Cucciarella, who's got that that mound of permed hair, I think, or curly hair, dragged to the ground. Yeah. And yeah, Mike Dean in the in the newspaper column said it it was um, violent conduct. I think didn't he, Martin? Um, and that he would have told the referee on the day if he was doing the right thing to go and look at his monitor, but he, he uh, made a mistake and didn't do that. Um, but you call them the PGMOL, this body that is responsible for, for referees. And they said there hadn't been a mistake. Is that correct? Well, they, they didn't accept that it was a mistake. I wouldn't say they denied there was a mistake. They just said they didn't accept there had been a mistake and um, just suggested it had been a subjective decision, which is fair enough. And that's fine if you stick. And if, if, if you want to say that and stick to that, that's fine. But then three days later, it, uh, you know, what they say is that, you know, they're trying to make you know, referees' decisions making more transparent. And that's why this, you know, that he's being allowed to do this column. But it's just the fact he's being paid a fee to reveal something like that, I just think is bonkers. Yeah, is there, is there not a more kind of formal mechanism? We were with Richard Masters just before the season started and they talked about uh, maybe releasing the audio between the referees and the VAR 24 hours after matches. But So that's one thing. But then... Even this kind of interview process or interview or column or whatever, the idea that it's an exclusive with with one newspaper, again, seems a little bit um, maybe um, distasteful or not not unprofessional in a way as well, how this process should be run. Yeah, it's. Um, I don't think it'll happen again because I, I think it's... Uh... I don't hadn't been th- thought through closely enough, I think. Um, it's not a good It's not a good look. But I think I mean there's a good argument for doing some, doing what they do in MLS in the USA, where they all the sort of critical decisions are sort of reviewed and put on YouTube and explained, and you know, if there's a mistake made and accepted, and it's it's there for everybody, and that is very good transparency. And with Howard Webb, who's MLS head of refereeing, likely to come back to the Premier League to take over, I think possibly that could that sort of thing could come in. Another interesting bit of news that I think has come out is that Liverpool have appointed a fans board. Um, this is in the sort of wake of the of the owners realizing they'd made a terrible mistake around the Super League, so they've appointed this fans board. Um, lots of members from the spirit of Shankly, mainly sort of a consultative body, but there is a they say they have they will have voting rights over two heritage items, which is one moving from Anfield. And two, joining a breakaway league. So um, that's quite an interesting development. As you say, it's the, this this reaction to the Super League, and there was all that talk in the aftermath about more more power for fans. And we're, I guess, a little bit more than a year year and change after that, and we're seeing the first fruits of what that might include. Liverpool being the first out of the blocks. There was talk about Manchester United. Um, Selling a block of shares 
to to their to their supporters, and I think that that remains on the table. And I think there was uh, some 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 sort of concrete detail of that in recent time. Um, and what 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 I gather, it's not going to be a whole bucket load of shares, but it's going to be the Class A shares, the ones with 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 uh, more voting power. Um, so a small number of those, but but these more powerful shares. So I guess some some change in the direction of travel. But I guess going back to how we started. Who, who knows who'll own Man United by the time um, all of that is realised? Probably the Glazers. <laughs> One thing to wrap up on, which is, I thought was quite interesting this week, was Richard McLaren, this Canadian lawyer who has um, done a lot of the sort of investigations into sort of Russian doping and other things like that. He, he's been saying that he thinks Russian and Belarusian athletes should not be banned from an international sport because of the war in Ukraine. Uh, he said, the way they are treated is not fair. There are reasons to let them participate again, because they did not start the conflict and they're not responsible for its course. Interesting on that, because that's um, ISC is facing a really, really difficult decision very, very soon, is whether they continue their, their recommendation that all Russian and Belarusian athletes are banned. Well, aren't they already banned, uh, well, the Russians anyway, and they have been for... God knows, you know, half a decade or more from world athletics. They, they haven't really been... Um, um, from world athletics, from yeah. world athletics, but not from the rest of the Olympic sport. Oh, I see, I see. Okay, yeah. yeah. But 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 so that, so he's okay with the world athletics ban. The Richard McLaren was one of the reasons why that ban came in in the first place. But he's not okay with this ban. He's not okay. He's not okay with the... Um... The, the 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 ban related to the war, and the invasion of Ukraine, yeah, which um, oh, yeah. he thinks they should be allowed to compete by the sounds of it. Which um, and yeah, the, as we talked about before, this is the the Olympic qualifying competitions for Paris twenty twenty four are about to start. I think the first ones do start next month or the month after. So the the IC has to decide what what it's going to do about its recommendations that. Russians should not be allowed to take part in sport. I mean, at the moment, I think it's only tennis, judo, and one other, which is allowed where they're still allowed Russians to take part in. 